I am the co-chair of the Women's Voices Racial Justice Committee. And one of the issues that our committee has decided to focus on for the foreseeable future is affordable housing in St. Louis. And there's nobody that knows more about the issue, the problems and the successes and the possibilities of working with housing than our speaker today, who is Chris Kramer. Chris Kramer has been president and CEO of Beyond Housing since 1993, which actually is most of his adult life. And the work of Beyond Housing does go truly beyond housing because they encompass both community development and family support services. The organization currently owns and manages hundreds of affordable rental housing units throughout St. Louis County. It also helps families toward home ownership and helps them avoid foreclosure. Beyond Housing currently has 140 employees, a $20 million a year budget, and between 10 and 15,000 people use their services every year. Under Chris Kramer's leadership, the 24-1 Collective was formed, bringing together civic leaders, nonprofits, and corporate partners to solve specific problems within the area of the Normandy School District. The 24-1 Partnership has resulted in the construction of a grocery store, a senior center, a retail complex, a full service bank, a four screen movie theater, a health clinic, a coffee shop, and a community land trust. Chris Kramer graduated from Washington University with a degree in urban studies. In addition to his extensive work in housing and community development, he has served many local and national organizations. And he has received numerous honors, including the Human, Humanist of the Year Award from the Ethical Society and a Leadership Award from Focus St. Louis. These are extraordinary honors, but we think that probably the one closest to his heart occurred in 2011 when he was inducted into the University City High School Hall of Fame. So we have asked Chris Kramer to talk with us today about the challenges that low-income families face in finding safe, affordable housing. These are families that work hard, pay taxes, and do all the right things. I suspect that Chris Kramer will say that he is not an expert, that the real experts are the people that Beyond Housing serves we can learn from both of these groups. So today we hope that he will help Women's Voices find a focus for meaningful advocacy on the issue of housing. So Chris, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Barbara, for that uh, wonderful introduction and uh, thanks to my, my longtime friend, Mary Schumann, for the, uh, for the invite. So uh, great, great to be here and uh, I'll tell you a little more about the Beyond Housing story and then and we'll, we'll, we'll talk um, uh, again, about the, the need for a decent and safe place to live for um, every citizen of our region and, quite frankly, of our country. So, so as Barbara indicated, um, you know, Beyond Housing is a multifaceted organization. We consider ourselves a comprehensive community building organization, um, looking at all the facets that make up a successful place. Um, our work is certainly regional in terms of all of our affordable um, uh, housing opportunities. Um, but our, our focus for the last 10 years or so has been in the boundaries of the Normandy Schools Collaborative. Um, and really the underpinning of our work, and, and Barbara alluded to it um, in, in the introduction, is um, we listen to those that we serve. Um, so we have a foundational belief in a model called ask, align, and act. Um, you ask the people that you serve, what are the challenges, what are the struggles, but more importantly, what are the solutions um, to make the place that they call home the best that it can be. So we just finished a um, uh, almost two year long process of doing community engagement here in, in the community that we work up uh, here called 24-1 or in the boundaries of the Normandy Schools Collaborative. And by the, the 24 is the number of small municipalities in the boundaries of the Normandy Schools Collaborative. And the one is their collective vision on the future for, uh, for their community. 
So we did two years of, of uh, community engagement to really ask them, you know, what are you seeing? What are the challenges? And what would you like to see happen? Uh, we put that back together to them um, uh, in a, a vision document that says, here's what we think we heard. Did we get it right? Um, and they said, yes, you got it right. And then here are some priorities underneath those key areas that we think are important. Um, and clearly understanding the importance of um, the housing stock of any community is one of their top priorities. They understand that, um, that they need to renovate the homes in their community. They need to attract more people to their community and they need to make the neighborhoods where people live um, uh, as best as they can be. So what we've been doing um, you know, these last 10 plus years in this community um, is both, um, uh, again, building new homes, uh, some for home ownership and some to add to our rental portfolio now, which is over 500 units. Um, and then also rehabbing existing homes, again, to sell to new homeowners and to add to our existing rental portfolio. And lastly, we've done over uh, 1,000 um, uh, uh, projects of owner-occupied home repair. Over 1,000 single-family homes have been renovated in, in this community. This idea of, again, investing in what we call the built environment, um, investing in what people see every day when they drive in their community, when they walk in their community, what others see as they drive and, and walk through this community to kind of change the perceptions about what's happening um, uh, in places in this part of, of the community. So in addition to that, um, if you live in one of our rental units, um, our goal is not simply to provide a roof over your head. Our goal is also to provide a myriad of individualized support services uh, based up on, up on the family's own aspirations and dreams. For us, it's not just about a roof. A roof is critically important, but not yet sufficient to help a lot of um, low-income families and single moms raising their kids move along their journey in life in a, in a way that will allow them and their children to be successful. So again, we offer a variety of those services that um, uh, can be financial in nature. Sometimes our families need help with uh, utility assistance and rent assistance and what happens if the car breaks down because St. Louis is not a great place for public transportation. Um, but also uh, someone wants to send their kids to college but are, but are struggling to figure out the resources to do it and how do they get it done. Sometimes our families um, have this dream to own a small business and they have a skill set that they've used for years and they need help figuring out how do they get that done. And quite frankly, sometimes uh, folks just need a little bit of help with the stress and strain of, of, of being poor. Um, and at the end of the day, it is uh, absolutely no fun being poor. Um, you know, this kind of these false arguments about people using the system and not being willing to work is quite frankly, it's just not true. Um, we see so many families and so many hardworking individuals that um, just want something better for themselves and for their kids and are, are willing to work hard for that and stay committed to that. Uh, we have some home, home ownership opportunities for our families as well. We have a one staff person who works solely um, with a small cohort of our rental housing families um, who have expressed a desire to become a homeowner. Uh, and we help them work through where they're at today, their credit portfolio today, what do they look like, what are the things they need, need to do to get positioned um, to become um, eligible to get receive a loan um, from a banking institution to, to buy a home um, and to become a homeowner. Um, every year we see anywhere from 10 to 15 families move on to home ownership. And we think that's fantastic and we support that, but we also know home ownership is not uh, right for everyone, nor is that what everyone wants. So again, our idea is to think about um, the children that live in the home and think about the head of the households. Um, we do a back to school event every year. Obviously everything in 2020 will have a big asterisk on it relative to how, how we delivered it, how we carried out because of um, COVID-19. Um, this year, we provided the Normie Schools Collaborative with over 3,000 backpacks um, full of school supplies for the children uh, heading back to school, whether virtual or um, uh, in, in person. But they, they do have an in-person option for kids from pre-K to fourth grade. Um, but we also make sure that all the families living in our rental units, which includes a fair amount of kids going to Normandy, but a whole lot of kids who live in Kirkwood and Webster and University City and Maplewood and Richmond Heights, that they have access to the school supplies they need to be successful as well. So again, when we think about our families, we certainly use um, you know, the, the idea of home um, as quite frankly a tool to serve families, as a, as a tool to serve children, as a tool to position families for longitudinal success. Um, the challenge with using a home as, as a tool for, again, providing um, a, a stepping stone to 
uh, again, what life can bring is that it is uh, very expensive to produce new units and there are very few uh, resources available to produce them. Um, again, the, the irony is the, the important role that having a, a roof over your head, that having a stable home and a stable community does for the well-being of families um, is not funded in any form, any significant form or fashion. When I tell folks that the unit of the federal government that produces the, uh, the most um, new units of affordable housing across this country um, is the IRS, people look at me with kind of a, a, a jaundiced look. And the reason why it's the IRS, because out of the IRS comes low-income housing tax credits. And those tax credits are allocated on a, on a per capita basis, state by state. Um, uh, and those tax credits, again, bring equity to a, uh, a development project to allow you know, homes to be built. Now, it's, it's a sad irony that the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, does not uh, have the resources to uh, any, in any significant way produce new units of affordable housing or to preserve existing units of affordable housing. So again, one of the things I would urge you as you guys think about, you know, um, what you may advocate for in the future as you're thinking about this particular subject matter is quite frankly, the, those of us who do this work just need some more resources. Um, and that's, I hate to be crass that it's all about money because it's not, but clearly the, the, the reality is uh, this funding cycle from the Missouri Housing Development Commission, where those federal tax credits will get allocated from, Saint, the whole, the entire St. Louis region may get four or five projects approved, totaling maybe 150 um, new units of affordable housing. Could be multifamily, could be single family. Um, my organization, um, during the course of the first three days of, of any given week gets about 150 calls from people needing a place to live, right? So on an annual basis, um, we can take care of th three days worth of phone call just to my organization alone, right? So sometimes it's, uh, I, I use the, 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 you know, the saying, it's not a question of is the glass half empty or half full, we just need a bigger damn glass, right? So there, there's just not enough resource to get this done. And, and part of it is this, this idea of, and I was talking to, to Barbara and Mary uh, before we started, just even about the phrase affordable housing. I've used it today because I think people just understand it. But I think that the dilemma becomes, it comes with a stigma, right? People just associate it with um, negative things. And if we're honest, people associate it with race by and large. Um, and with that comes again, all the other negative connotations. And it's simply just inaccurate, and it, and it makes the, it makes a conversation difficult if you start off with using language that comes with the baggage that affordable housing comes with. I, I know low income housing is 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 worse. Uh, people have tried workforce housing. I I don't think that's much better, right? You know, we all live in homes, right? We all live in uh, places that we come home to um, every night that we sit around the kitchen table with our family to talk about the day and you know, lay our head down um, uh, on a pillow every night to go to sleep. Well, everybody in the region deserves that same kind of opportunity. And we just don't make that happen by and large because we haven't had the political courage to say, we will spend money on this. We will make this a priority and find the resources to get it done. If you extrapolate out 150 calls the first three days a week, we get over 200 calls every week of people needing a decent and safe place to live. Um, so again, you know, imagine if we started investing in um, opportunities for people to have a place to call home. That if we, we know this is one of these research things that is just, you know, uh, tired and worn out, right? Like, um, uh, we, as, as an example, like we know investing in kids when they're young is a good thing and, and, and derives great benefit longitudinally for that child um, and, and, and for its community. We, have, we don't need more research on that. The same is true for if we give somebody a decent, safe place to live, their life is going to be better. It's just, again, it's just simple fact and the data will support it. If we know that to be fact, why, why don't we invest in it in a real and meaningful way? Why are there always just 
if you get lucky beyond housing, you might get an allocation of tax credits so you can produce a handful of units that literally you can rent in one day. Um, and it takes us three years to develop those, those homes from a financing standpoint, from a do we get lucky to get the tax credits when we apply for them. Um, there needs to be a better way um, if families are going to do better if our region is going to do better, if we wanna be a prosperous region, right? If this region is ever gonna grow, we have to tackle the issues that families and neighborhoods struggle with that quite frankly, we have done little, little to address for the last 30 to 40 years. Um, so if we're serious about the region being successful and serious about wanting to have a new narrative about who we are in St. Louis, then one of the things we need to tackle is again, the issues that families and neighborhoods struggle and the provision of decent, safe housing for folks to call home is smack dab in the middle of that. Again, uh, I look, look out my window here. I'm in my office in Pine Lawn. Um, we've built uh, over, over 80 homes here in the last uh, four years. We've rehabbed another 50 homes. We've uh, demolished another 45 homes. We've built a park, a playground and done any number of things here, but I can also look out my window and see a number of vacant, abandoned, dilapidated homes um, that either need to be renovated or need to come down. Uh, and where are the resources to, 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 to get that done? This small municipality doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the tax base to do it. St. Louis County has a modest amount of funding for the entirety of St. Louis County to tackle community development needs. So again, existing funding resources just are simply inadequate, woefully inadequate to address the issue. Um, so again, if we're gonna be serious about uh, how do we tackle the issue of, of affordable housing, uh, in, in my estimation, uh, the first thing we have to tackle is, 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 the, is the lack of, of resources that are available for organizations like mine. And there are a number of us in the region um, that do this kind of work, um, that if we had more resources, we could, again, uh, uh, create more uh, opportunities for a place to call home for so many families um, in this region. So again, what we find day in and day out is um, uh, families want an opportunity to live a successful life. Um, and the struggles that they face are many. They are multifaceted. And again, uh, a roof over their head does not solve uh, all the challenges that they face. It is a great and, and certainly critical beginning point. But what also needs to happen is then understand what else, um, uh, again, are there stumbling blocks for them to lead their best lives possible. We know what systemic racism has done to neighborhoods. We know what systemic racism um, has done to families. Um, and we know what it's done to our educational system. So again, are there ways we can invest in creating opportunities for families to be successful, both in, again, how we produce the home for them to live in, but then how do we support them and their families on their journey? So again, the resources that we try to garner and provide for our families are about really understanding where you at today and where would you like to get to? And we'll start with making sure you're not worried about where you come home to every night, that you're not worried about what's outside your front door, um, that you can take a deep breath and say, okay, where do I wanna go? Where do we want, where do I want my children to go? What are their dreams and aspirations? And how do I make those kinds of things happen in my life and in my children's life? And when we do that, shockingly, amazingly, people do well, right? It's like we, we, uh, we built and own a grocery store in Pagedale. It was the proverbial food desert, right? The community said under our Ask, Align, and Act model, we'd love to have a grocery store. So we, we figured out how to develop and build a grocery store. Um, and lo and behold, you put a grocery store in a place where there isn't a grocery store, people actually show up and buy groceries. Like who knew? What a radical thing, right? So guess what? If, if we produce, uh, again, housing for families in need, guess what? We're gonna find people to live there, to occupy them and to be successful. Again, we just have to have the courage and quite frankly, the, the boldness to say the, the things that we've been doing simply haven't worked. It, it's, we're past the time for tinkering around the edges. We're past the time for assuming we can just kind of reshuffle the deck and, um, and then hopefully have some better outcomes, right? We need bold and decisive and courageous action to say, if we're going to tackle uh, the, the, the issue of the need of housing in the region and quite frankly in the country, 
um, and if we want to tackle the issues of neighborhoods that, that are struggling, um, we have to invest in a real and meaningful way in both producing new um, and renovating existing housing stock for both home ownership and, and for rental. Uh, failure to do so is uh, puts us in the same spot in the next 20 years. What will happen is you know, organizations like us will have some modicum of success. We will stave off the rapid deterioration of places like Pine Lawn and Pagedale. But ultimately, we're not going to get there because, again, we, we, we can't move fast enough. Uh, to tackle all the needs and make sure there are resources available and uh, and we get after all the housing challenges that um, uh, that uh, are in our small community here as part of the region. Um, you can look at what used to be an incredibly beautiful, gorgeous housing stock in North City in St. Louis and see what happens to it over time. Abandonment, uh, neglect, decay. And the same can be true for for, for communities. Again, communities will eventually die. Um, and it's, a not, it's not pretty to see and not pretty to watch. Uh, and we're in the midst of some of that right now, right? Watching what's happening, watching the violence, watching, again, uh, the, the loss of life. It's, again, uh, and quite frankly, we do very little about it, right? We have these paltry um, responses like, well, let's put some more police on the street. Uh, okay, but we need a whole heck of a lot more than that. So again, I would just I would encourage you to be bold, to be audacious, uh, to challenge people to say, look, dr dr drive around, drive around this community and, 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 and tell us this is okay, that this is acceptable, that we think as a region, it's okay to have neighborhoods uh, that look like this and communities that look like this and families that have to live in these kinds of situations. Um, we can do better. Um, uh, uh, Again, I hate to make it as simple as resources, but quite frankly, that is the biggest challenge that we face. We have to execute then get everything done. The families that live in our homes have to work hard and be committed and do their part. But at the end of the day, um, if we're going to have any significant and meaningful change, um, we have to have a different conversation, have the courage to say, unless we invest in the future of, of families in the region and invest in the future of communities in our region. Um, we're kidding ourselves about what the future um, can look like. So I'll stop now so we can have maybe a little bit of a more of a conversation. I'm happy to fill in any blanks, um, give more details about our work or more details about, um, again, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the opportunities that exist or don't exist for families who need housing today. Uh, thank you, Chris. We already have one question in our chat box here. Okay. Um, and the questions are, uh, are there other cities that do this well? What is different about their source of funding? And what are their best practices? I guess that was three questions. Yeah. So there really isn't any place that does a, you know, a bang up job in terms of allocating uh, non-traditional um, revenue sources. There are some parts of the country that have affordable housing trust funds and they have um, other, other resources, but the need for affordable housing is everywhere across the country from affordable places like St. Louis to inaffordable places like San Francisco and other parts of the country. So there aren't really any great examples of regions who figured out affordable housing. There are small pockets of, of successes in some places, but there's really no, no particular region that has figured this out um, uh, and had the collective courage to invest in the kind of uh, resource delivery mechanisms that would be needed and necessary to, again, address the problems of the lack of um, uh, affordable housing. I mean, look, at the end of the day, so we have waiting lists for um, uh, uh, the Section 8 program, right, which provides a monthly subsidy to help you afford um, uh, a place to live. So, so we have waiting lists that are in the tens of thousands and they open up for a day or two and then they close right back up because there's only a scant few new opportunities um, uh, of, for folks to, to kind of get on a list to get a, a voucher. So again, it's just this idea of it is this scant resource that is so hard to come by and so hard to find that people wait years um, for their name to get called. And when the name gets called, they are clearly, you know, hoping and praying that they can find a place because that's not always easy to find a place either. So again, as, as, a, as a society, we should do better than force people to be on waiting lists for years 
to ensure they have a decent and safe place to live. One of the frustrations I think that many of us see is um, neighborhoods that have aging but still affordable housing can't seem to get reinvestment by um, you know the lending institutions whether they you know whether they're owner occupied or if they're uh, you know the landlord can't even get anything to reinvest in those neighborhoods. Um, is there a, a, a solution or a, a, an approach that could help with that? Um, you know, well, you, you, you can't refinance your home. You can't you can't put a, a decent roof on again. You know that type of thing. So so a couple of things. I mean, there there are, there, are, there are some banks who do that kind of lending. Um, uh, Midwest Bank Center and Carrollton Bank in particular are two pretty progressive uh, banking institutions here um, in the St. Louis region that I would certainly um, advocate on um, you know, folks uh, reaching out to them. But some of the other challenges, there are just some economic mismatches um, in low income communities, because again, we've allowed them to deteriorate so significantly. Okay. So uh, as an example, if, if we were to build a brand new house, you know, literally right outside my window here in Pine Lawn, um, it would cost, this is a modest three bedroom, one bath, um, 1,200 square foot house, it would cost us probably, let's say about 180,000 to build all in. Um, we could probably sell it for maybe 90,000, mm. right? So there's this great mismatch between the economics of what it takes to develop affordable housing and its actual market value. Uh, if we want to do a rehab and we're, we just bought a house literally outside my window that's been vacant for years with this awful blue tarp on the roof forever that I drive by at least twice a day and I hate it. So I've, I've made my staff go buy the doggone thing because it's just awful looking. Um, it's going to cost us probably 15, 20,000 to buy it, another 30, 40,000 to renovate it. So um, we're in at 60,000. If I sold it because it's an older, smaller existing home, uh, with only two bedrooms, I could probably sell it for about 40000 So while my gap is smaller, I still have a gap. And again, the reason why this has occurred is we've allowed neighborhoods to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. Because basically we've said, well, I don't live there. right? I'm over here in my other place that, that I'm good with. That place is really unknown to me because I don't have any reason to drive through and to go by there. And again, if we, again, if you want to get to the root cause of that again it's systemic racism right people of color were told where they could where they could live and where they couldn't live and by the time we change that suburb you know the, the particularly inner ring suburbs were all all built out now there was no not many places left left to find them to live even if you could afford uh, the prices that were there right so again we've allowed this economic disconnect to occur and now sadly what it's going to take is an investment in providing subsidies for um, somebody who wants to rehab a house, somebody who wants to reinvest in their neighborhood, someone wants to move in and, and make this place their home. Again, we're gonna need additional resources to get this done. Thank you. Um, Becky Clausen asked a question. Um, you talked about Section 8, or you referred to Section 8 housing uh, vouchers recently. Her question is, how should I respond to those who say that people who get Section 8 housing will play the system to always stay there. Again, that's just, I, I would ask him, what's the proof? Like what, it, that's, you heard that somewhere? On, you read it on Facebook, so therefore it must be true? I, I just add, it's, it's just not accurate, right? Again, and, and, and on some levels, so what? Right? So, I've lived in my house for almost 30 years. I, am I somehow gaming some system? So again, if they're, if, they're, if they're a good neighbor and a good person, what difference does it make, right? At the end of the day, so, so the, the other, again, this, the other discount that people just need to really get their arms around is um, this notion of y'all can receive a Section 8 if you're income eligible. Again, once, once you make a certain, above a certain income, you're no longer eligible um, to receive the monthly subsidy. Um, so folks are working, doing the best that they can, um, but for a whole host of reasons, and again, in St. Louis, the biggest reason is uh, longitudinal systemic racism, 
Um, they don't have the skills and the educational attainment to get the kind of job where they can, oh, I'm going to move out. Now, that's, that's not all, all folks, but that certainly is a certain percentage of folks who live in affordable housing. That what they're trying to do is position their children to, to, to take the big step out, right? To say, okay, let me get you situated where, you, you know, you're not moving around, you know, every six months and you're not living with the stress and strain of all the other trauma that comes with, with, with being poor. And let me see if I can position you to have a slightly better life than, than, than I had, which is every parent's aspiration for their children, right? You want your life, your kid's life to be just a little bit better than yours. And again, that's all people are trying to do. So, so again, the stigma of, oh, you have a Section 8 something and that now I know everything about you is just unfair and quite frankly, just not true. Thank you. We're, this is streaming live on Facebook and we get, we're getting a few questions from Facebook as well. Uh, Liz, <coughs> excuse me, asks, how do we motivate, inspire people from wealthier suburbs to do our part to support housing across the region? Can we share our tax revenues? And she does go on to say she doesn't know how to inspire people of means to share their wealth to support everyone, even though it's our moral duty as human beings. Care to comment? Uh, well, well a a amen to, 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 her, to her last statement. Um, so what I, what I would, again, and it's a hard argument, but, but, it, but, it, but it's the argument, we're all connected together, right? At the end of the day, if St. Louis is going to be a, a, a prosperous place and be the region that we want, we have to stop ignoring the problems that exist, right? We can't just drive out to the far-flung suburbs and say everything is going to be okay and occasionally come downtown for a Cardinals game or something else, right? Uh, you have to be committed to this region writ large. Um, and, and putting your head in the sand does not make challenges go away. So the quicker we as a region have the collective courage to say, what are the big challenges that are facing us as a region that are preventing us from being as successful as we want and quite frankly should be. Um, and we believe at Beyond Housing that one of the biggest challenges is we've not uh, invested in the places that have the biggest challenges. Um, and if we are, have the courage to do that, that's both public dollars and private philanthropy, right? Again, at the end of the day, we are a very charitable region, right? We have one of the most successful United Ways in the country. And again, as a region, we're very philanthropic. But where do those philanthropic dollars go? God bless my, my, my alma mater, Washington University. They don't need a nickel of anybody's money anytime soon. They're doing just fine, right? So again, how do we say... How, how do you take dollars that you can invest in the region and put it in place that are going to have longitudinal impact and not that higher education isn't important. I'm not suggesting that, but I also know that my alma mater has some level of billions of dollars in their endowment. Um, and, and again, I don't think for a little while they need any, any, any more, any more in their endowment. What we need is to invest in our communities. So folks and parents are comfortable sending their kids to Washington University and St. Louis University and not worried about the neighborhoods around those institutions, that those neighborhoods are strong and healthy and vibrant and people feel good about, again, investing um, in their children and in this region. Thank you. Um, that brings me to um, a, a blog that you recently wrote that was very powerful. And you said, um, if this virus has reminded us of anything, it should be that none of us, either as individuals or communities, is an island. You said that societal ambivalence to the plight of our neighbors is a new way of remaining apart from the others. And when we operate under that illusion, we perpetuate a lot of our community problems, which invariably become our own. Would you elaborate on the cascading effect of um, that a struggling community has on its neighbors and the larger community? Well, again, uh, you know, we, we know um, uh, that external St. Louis, we're, we're, we're known as the murder capital, uh, as, as, one, as, as one instance. Uh, in, some, in some circles, we're known as the STD capital as well, two fine things to be known for. Um, so at, at the end of the day, as we think about attracting people here, as we think about um, uh, again, how do we, uh, as a region, say, how can we legitimately uh, compete for uh, 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 20,000 new jobs at Amazon? Well, part of it is what does the region have to offer? And you can only say the zoo, the art museum, and the cardinal so many times, and then, and then what? 
right? So again, the things that have been holding us back and the perceptions about us, which are based in reality, um, are that we have neighborhoods that struggle. And when neighborhoods struggle, lots of negative things occur like violence. Um, but the answer to that is not more policing. The, the answer is investing in those kinds of things that uh, promulgate violence, like uh, the lack of affordable housing, like poor educational systems that don't position children for long-term success, like lack of access to decent paying jobs, uh, like uh, lack of access to primary health care, like lack of access to um, uh, groceries, like uh, lack of access to many, many other things. Um, so again, it, if we want to, again, be prosperous as a region, and I think there's a whole cadre of folks now who are more interested in this idea of equity than we have in the past. If we want to be an equitable region, um, then we need to invest in those places that have not had any significant investments in decades. It's not, it's not rocket science here, right? We, you know, again, if you invest in significant and meaningful ways, neighborhoods and communities will get better. Now, it's not just about simply, oh, let's throw a few dollars and build a few housing units, because that's not going to be sufficient. It's about what makes up the fabric of successful places is, yes, a good housing stock, but also a good public education system. And again, access to healthcare and access to retail and access to those kinds of things that quite frankly, many of us just take for granted because that's what we've always known in the places that we've lived. Well, we should be able to do that in every part of, of the St. Louis region. Um, but we have to have the courage to invest and to make it happen. And it's not gonna happen overnight, right? We don't fix failed public education in an election cycle, for goodness sakes. Right? But what we do is we start the process of investing in and holding up high expectations for everyone involved in all the systems that have failed to date, from public education to housing to, to health to all, all these specters, right? Hold people accountable, provide resources to get the work done. Building affordable housing is not rocket science, for goodness sakes, right? It just takes the resources to, to, to get it done. You know, again, building a grocery store, again, is not curing cancer, right? It's just simply having the right kind of resources to make it happen. Um, and again, as a region, if we have the courage to do that, we can make significant difference in the lives of so many people, make neighborhoods better, and then make the region better as a byproduct. Thank you. Um, Amy has a question for you. Uh, have you seen changing needs issues since the beginning of the pandemic? Uh, do you anticipate changes in the next six months? Uh, look, the, the, the needs have been exacerbated. Um, you know, the, the issue of people being hungry was, is not a new thing. It's just been exacerbated significantly. Um, the challenges of paying rent and utilities uh, have always existed. They've just been exacerbated. They brought in some people who historically have not been in systems like this. So we did a food distribution here at our, at, um, our offices um, uh, uh, April, May, and June as we had the grant funding to do so. Um, and I was here for just about every one of those distributions on, uh, on those Saturdays. Um, and you could tell the people that had, this was all a brand new experience for them, that they were frightened and scared and um, just didn't understand like, how the hell is this happening to me, right? I'm not supposed to drive my car into this parking lot, pop my trunk so a stranger can put a box of food in, in it for me and my kids. Um, so you could just see the fear on some, some folks that, um, that they, they just didn't know how, how the heck this had happened to them. Um, so again, some of the need um, uh, was the same. Some of it, again, just exacerbated um, and brought in a whole bunch of new folks um, uh, uh, to, the, to this world of, of living on, on a razor's edge. Um, as we move forward, look, I think um, that the loss of jobs are still pretty dramatic. Um, I think what we've, what we've seen is, and again, I think it's really hard to understand um, unless you're living it. So a lot of the families that we serve and live in our communities um, worked in a lot of the retail spaces where their jobs were lost instantaneously, or they worked in the healthcare field in some form or fashion. So while maybe they still had their job uh, was available to them, but it also put themselves and their loved one in harm's way. So they had this terrible decision to make, like, do I keep my job and my paycheck, but in doing so, I put my family in harm's way, or do I lose my job, 
keep my family safe, but my economic future is quite frankly, absolutely unknown, right? And what a terrible decision to have to you know, put, put, put families in. So what it, what it laid bare for us, if we have the courage to look and to say, are we okay with this, is that there are so few people uh, that can go without the next paycheck, that uh, if that ne next paycheck does not happen, their life comes crumbling down. Um, and is that the society that we think we want? And is that what we want to have happen? Um, will we see a global pandemic, um, you know, uh, next year, the year after? We certainly hope not, right? But that doesn't mean we shouldn't work on all the challenges that has made life so difficult, including, again, let's go back to systemic racism. People of color have been dying at a significantly higher percentage uh, than, than, than white folks because of COVID-19, because of comorbidities, in particular with diabetes and, and heart disease. So, um, and those things happen over time, again, because of systemic racism and what that does to families and communities. So again, we can, uh, we can put our head in the sand and say, oh, it's gonna be better because we're gonna have a vaccine and then let's move on. No, uh, life is still challenging for many, many families um, and rebounding from this and weathering this particular awful storm that's happening um, is, is gonna take a long time for us to get past. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Finch asks, would you comment on the latest effort to redo downtown St. Louis? Should this effort and the money be redirected? So uh, what I would say, Barbara, as opposed to either or, I would say and both. That, yeah, I think as, as a region, we do need a downtown uh, that is developed and attractive and safe and is, you know, uh, again, brings revenue, um, you know, to the broader region and to the, and to the city of St. Louis. But it doesn't have to be, you know, a false option of we can only do that and nothing else, right? Uh, yes, we need a vibrant downtown, vibrant uh, central corridor, but we also have to have strong and healthy neighborhoods. And again, those things don't, are, aren't in contradiction to each other. Matter of fact, they work together, right? You know, well, you know, if we think about, if we have a vibrant downtown, it's gonna need a lot of folks who, who work in the service sector. And it, wouldn't it be great if they lived nearby and didn't have to have long, long travel routes uh, to get to work every day. So again, in the, the intentionality of resource allocation, the intentionality of how do you put things together I mean, the work that we're doing is uh, there's a whole lot of intentionality. So we built a grocery store and then we built across the parking lot a senior building with a bank on the bottom floor. And then catty corner from that, we built a, a movie theater with four screens, 375 seats. And then we brought a health facility there. And then we had a coffee shop and a restaurant. And we now have another building under construction that's going to have three more restaurants, a little pub, a clothing store, a jewelry store, and a community kitchen. So there's just intentionality about how we invest dollars to create a place that people want um, and that will bring a vibrancy, both economic and otherwise, to that place. Um, the work we're doing is absolutely replicatable. It just takes the financial resources and the collective uh, will of folks to say, we will invest in those communities um, that quite frankly have been ignored and abandoned for far too long. Thank you. Um, there's been some interesting uh, chat on Facebook or comments that are made because this, you know, for the live stream here. We have one quest question again from Liz. I'm wondering if we as residents of the St. Louis region could use our purchasing power to put pressure on some of our major companies here to invest in significant ways in affordable housing and all the accompanying systemic changes you're talking about. Love the idea. Look, um, you know, what's the old saying? Um, money talks and, and BS walks, right? So at, at the end of the day, you want to get people's attention, you know, uh, you know focus on the, the economics of, of, of their business. I think it's a great idea because, again, it's not going to happen on its own. If le left, to, left to our own devices, we've, we've seen what we've got in the last, you know, 40 to 50 years. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm all for innovative ideas to get people to think differently, to push people Look, if we don't make people uncomfortable um, about uh, the, their, the way they think about the world, then we're not doing our jobs, right? You have to push people out of their comfort zones because to be comfortable has gotten us where we're at today. We're a very polite region. We don't, we don't like, we don't like you know, uncomfortable situations. Um, you know, we want everything to go back to the way it once was, 
right? So we need to push people to say, no, and things need to be better than the way they once were. Um, uh, the families um, who want a better life, the children who deserve an opportunity to have their dreams and aspirations come, come true, uh, um, uh, deserve nothing less from us as a region. And if it takes, um, you know, a, a pretty, pretty radical step by some economic boycotts, I think that's a great idea and, and count me in. Uh, you, talk, you mentioned intentional allocations um, of resources. I read that 3% of the money spent on worldwide military budgets could end world hunger. Uh, Jenny Berger asks, if you had funding, what would you do first? And how much is needed to begin to make a difference? So for us, we are, we are, we are about to launch a um, 10 year, $200 million campaign. Um, that is uh, multifaceted. Um, as I mentioned, our, our work again hits multiple sectors. So of that 200 million, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build more houses. We're gonna rehab more, more existing homes and, that are vacant and, and, and reoccupy them. Uh, we're gonna give out more grants to existing um, homeowners. Um, we're gonna uh, invest in more college savings accounts. Right now we have um, over 350 college savings accounts at Normandy High School. I wanna have every child um, in the Normandy School District to have a college savings account, a 529 account that is real and meaningful, that both is uh, uh, economically sound in nature, but is also symbolically real in nature to tell that child and that family that post-secondary education is absolutely something that your child can do if that's what they want to do. Um, and there are resources here um, to help you. Um, we need, I have two community health workers on staff. I need at least 15. I have 13 staff people embedded in the Normie schools. Uh, they have 3,500 kids. I need twice as many staff in those Normandy schools to help the families and those kids address all the challenges um, uh, that they face. Um, I need to build at least three more buildings on Page Avenue so we finish out that stretch of Page Avenue at Page and Ferguson so we have a place, we have a, a gathering space, an economic uh, engine for that part of the 24-1 footprint. I need to build five economic development projects in Pine Lawn at, near the intersection of Jenny Station Road um, and Natural Bridge to again jumpstart uh, the economic mobility of that um, particular place. I need to build um, a, a brand new family support center. Right now we have a family support center that, uh, that serves up to 60 kids every day in an after school program and our summer program and we need to serve at least um, 500 to 600 kids um, uh, in, in a brand new facility. So we make sure that both after school and the summertime, we're giving our kids um, the, the best nurturing environment to support their um, uh, mental and physical well-being. As an example of some things that I'd like to do with, with, with 200 million. So um, those are, again, investments that are multifaceted that will be intentionally integrated that look at the challenges that families and neighborhoods face that intentionally deliver them in a way that they are connected and not delivered in silos because we know people's lives aren't um, intentionally segregated by Monday is my housing day and Tuesday is my health day and Wednesday I'm gonna focus on education, right? All those things are uh, put together intentionally in places that are successful and we wanna see the same thing happen um, in our community as well. Uh, Karen asks, does Beyond Housing only work in the Normandy district and how are you collaborating, collaborating with UMSL? Uh, so while, while our, our main emphasis um, is in the boundaries of the Normandy Schools Collaborative, we own rental housing um, all throughout St. Louis County. We do first time home buyer work um, in St. Louis County, St. Charles County, Jefferson County. Um, so our work is regional, but the, the big emphasis is in the boundaries of the Normandy Schools Collaborative. Um, our partnership with UMSL, quite frankly, has been growing over the last couple of years. Um, uh, again, they, they are an anchor institution. Um, you know, they, they are physically located here. They should be uh, a prominent player in the redevelopment of this community. And uh, they've been doing some, 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 some great work at partnering with us and many other organizations in town. Um, uh, uh, one of their new um, vice, vice presidents um, in community development is on the Beyond Housing Board, a gentleman named Carl Gunther. And he's a fantastic, dynamic young leader that has really, uh, you know, again, pushing the university to have uh, bigger and more sustainable partnerships with community and community organizations like Beyond Housing. So I am uh, anxious to see that relationship grow um, and to see more opportunities, such as the university um, has a big uh, checkbook when it comes to they buy stuff um, from different vendors. I'd love to have uh, their vending uh, apparatus 
really uh, look at uh, community-owned businesses and, and how they can invest in community-owned businesses um, here in the 24-1 footprint and in other parts of the surrounding ge geography of the university to really invest in community and invest in ways that uh, they can use their resources um, in ways that will hopefully will be catalytic and revolving in nature. We have one more set of questions from Ruth. Um, you said beyond housing can be replicated. How did it get its start and what would it take to start a similar project in another area? Where does most of your funding come from? So again, uh, so much of, of, of our work is about relationships. Um, uh, you know, we use the phrase community building happens at the speed of trust. So the way you get started is you have to have an organization that is embedded in the community and takes time to build relationships um, and to earn trust. Um, again, our, we're, we're, we're allowed to lead this, this, this initiative, but the moment leadership in this community says, we don't wanna work with Beyond Housing anymore, that's not a doggone thing we can do, right? So again, you start with you know, um, the voice of the community and an organization who's in, who has built that trust and is embedded in that community in some form or fashion. Um, create a plan um, and then begin to, you know, to do the day in blocking and tackling of getting the work done. Uh, our budget is a combination of uh, charitable contributions. This year we'll have about oh, six to seven million dollars in charitable contributions. Um, and then we have a lot of uh, earned income and other grant opportunities. So you own 500 units of rental housing, you get a fair amount of income from that rental housing. If you own grocery stores and other things, you generate income from that, as well as, um, uh, again, other fees that we get from some of the work that we do. So it's a pretty multifaceted um, approach. We get very little direct federal um, government assistance and some that's historically been um, intentional just because of the bureaucracies and the headaches of dealing with the federal government. But at the end of the day, um, they do have buckets of money that we're going to start applying for because we need every nickel we can to, to do this work. Um, we get a little bit of state money, but, but not a lot of state money. We're going to start being more aggressive at approaching um, those public sector dollars uh, more than we have in the past. Well, we have about five more minutes. Um, if, if there are no further questions, though, Chris, would you like to make any wrap up remarks? I know you've been carrying the burden of talking here, so. Uh, that's okay. So, well, well, what I would suggest to this group, because again, you've, you've intentionally said um, the issue of housing is, is, is important to you. Um, I, would, I would just encourage you and, and implore you to, um, you know, keep pushing and, um, and really ask people to think about this in a much different way. Um, that we don't need, you know, two percent more of anything that's out there, right? We need significant um, uh, increases in funding that's available. We need to, again, uh, do the proverbial hearts and minds as well. You know, I I usually ask people um, if I get the opportunity, um, uh, uh, tell me about the first place that you remember as home, and what about it do you remember, right? And typically, folks will remember both kind of the house, the apartment, whatever the physical structure is. But they'll also talk about, you know, what was outside and the park and their friends and other things that, that they did. Um, and I would just say that same kind of notion of home is what, quite frankly, every child deserves. That idea of, of being in a place that you feel safe and a place that nurtured your um, development and that uh, was your springboard to your own personal success. Um, that we should do that for every child um, in this region and in this country. Um, and again, the only thing we lack is the courage to allocate the resources to get it done. We know, we know how to do all this work. None of this work is confusing. We just don't have enough scale. Um, we don't have enough capital to get to the levels of scale to really uh, make a difference um, in a real and meaningful way. So I would just um, uh, encourage you and implore you to, um, uh, to, to push and push hard um, because if we don't, things aren't going to change in a real and meaningful way. Um, I said that we were, didn't have any more questions, but we've actually had one that I missed, apparently, and also a comment uh, from Facebook. The comment from Facebook was, I hope that one of those buildings on page is a, working tra a work training center or for a GED or computer classes, something in that nature. Um, uh, as of now, it is not. There is the community kitchen, which is a training facility for folks getting into the culinary space. 
Uh, we've been trying to uh, work with a number of folks who do coding and that kind of work. We've yet to find a partner um, yet to be in that space. So if, if the person with that comment knows of anybody, please um, send them our way. Yeah, and I want to thank the people who've been commenting on Facebook. If you know, you can go back and, and read some of those comments and suggestions for further reading. Uh, the question that I apparently missed was from Molly. <clears throat> Are we asking the right questions? Is it that housing isn't affordable or has the ongoing legacy of racism and oppression made it improbable that people will be able to meet their basic needs without living paycheck to paycheck until we do reparations? Where does reparations fit into affordable housing? That's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, I, I look, I, I think you could certainly frame uh, reparations in significant investment in communities of color um, that will include um, a housing component. I mean, there's no, no, there's, there's no question um, that, again, systemic racism uh, over generations and generations and generations have brought us to where we're at today. Um, and, and again, in, in, incremental change is not going to make um, much difference. We need significant change. If reparations is the tool to do that, then clearly investment in large sums of dollars in, in communities of color to allow for housing development, to allow for economic development, to allow for access to health care and access to retail and access to jobs uh, would certainly be appropriate and would address a lot of the problems that so many communities of color face today. Thank you. Barbara, would you like to make any closing comments? Unmute yourself. <laughs> Barbara? No. Yeah, I'm here. I would just like to say thank you to Chris and thank you to everybody who had questions and who listened in. This is a really complex subject and we have our work cut out for us, but I think we all realize we're in the middle of a pandemic now. It will end at some point. We can't go back to normal, we can't go back to what was. We have to do better. And this is one area where women's voices can really make a difference in talking to people who have influence in this area. You know, St. Louis County spent $2 million on a surge morgue that has been used maybe two dozen times and is now shuttered. We can do better than this. We need to think strategically and we need to act and we need to be able to talk about these issues with people who can make a difference. One person who has made an incredible difference in this community is Chris Kramer. And what a fabulous example you are, Chris. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. We appreciate you and the work you do. Thank you. And thanks to everybody who tuned in today. Thank you, Chris. Take care.